I'm actually, I am actually ill, so it's not just a cough for drawing your attention. <laughs> okay, hello guys, let's get started. Lovely to uh, see you all and, and to have you here as well as we, we don't do this anymore, but we've given it, it's an international uh, publisher event. Uh, last minute we've opened the, the venue for the live stream uh, audience as well, so we do have a few people, hello, um, um, online as well. So this is the uh, midterm, I think now the third Center for Poetry and Poetics event, but with a slightly different angle because it's the first, it's, a, it's a kind of mini celebration for us. We've got a new series running or uh, a new series which has started running as we speak uh, called Black Humanities Reading Series. So this is a kind of collaborative event between uh, and the research series, uh, the new research series. Uh, uh, so Ronnie can't be here today, but huge thanks to Ronnie as well uh, for everything, accommodating our writers some of them anyway, and and uh, helping to set this up. So um, the, uh, and first and foremost, uh, uh, a very warm welcome to our four writers. Uh, some of them are friends, uh, to Gazal Masedek, to J.R. Carpenter, Safa Fati, and Fran Locke, they're all sitting in the first row, so just you, you know who they are. Uh, I'm Maggie Lahotsky, I'm the director for the Center uh, for Poetry and Poetics. Um, just for those who don't know me. Um, the event is going to be about an hour and a half or so, we'll see how it goes, but uh, calculate some extra time uh, at the end of the readings for some what Sam Latkin would call awkward mingling. I've nicked that, I've, I've, I've nicked that phrase and been using it since he left. So for the past 10 years, I love it. Some awkward mingling uh, with the writers uh, and, uh, and uh, around the books. And because they are on sales tonight, on sale tonight, uh, you will be able to get hold of one, two, or three, or four, or as many as you want to. But make Gaza's life easy so she doesn't have to carry them back home to London to <laughs> uh, That would be really awesome. Um, so the order of uh, our readers today, can I just also say something rather personal, which is that I've been trying to get hold of these four to read together during the same event for about two years now. So for me, it's a personal triumph uh, <laughs> 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 to, to have achieved that, given that everybody is coming from everywhere. Like uh, I know Safa was uh, traveling from uh, France uh, a few days ago, and we'll be traveling back very soon as well. Um, so it's been difficult, but we are here. Uh, and, and that's an absolutely awesome thing for me. Um, so we're gonna, the order will be uh, Gazal uh, starting, J.R. Carpenter for uh, second, 
then Safa Fati, and we'll finish with Fran, Fran Log. There won't be a break between them, but obviously if uh, you're desperate, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you can <laughs> quietly come and go uh, as it suits. Um, so um, I also will be introducing the, the individual authors individually rather than what I normally do is in bundles. Uh, uh, sometimes it works, but for this specific event, I think it's best if I go one by one. So therefore, I'm going to start with Gazam Sade, a good friend, poet, uh, publisher, editor, uh, and translator. Uh, Gazam Sadek is the founder of uh, Pamanar Press, an independent publisher of poetry, translation, hybrid, and crit critical writing. Her own work has been published by Gam Press, uh, it Thomas, Thomas yeah. say it again. It's Italian, it's Jam, J. Jam, perhaps. Jam, Jam, maybe. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm good with that. So, Jam or Gam Press, uh, Thomas, Litmus Press, Firmament, and Black Box Manifold, uh, run by, edited by, uh, co edited by Adam Piet, who is here, obviously, tonight among uh, other publications. Gazal is also a member of the editorial advisory board for the, uh, the journal of British and Irish uh, Innovative Poetry. So what we're going to do with Gazal and I uh, is uh, she will be reading her own work ASAP. But we, before the, we do that, do you want to? Sure. Or do you want to stay there for I, the... I can't say No, no, I'm only yeah. trying. Just trying away from uh, the... Because we are so like... Yes, yeah. hello. So, so that they are actually like... Yeah, I'm not. No, just no, I'm kidding. Well, you are here. In no, the... I am here. Yeah, definitely. Sure. So... Um, Pleasure to be here. So you wanted to kick off... I wanted to kick off with a little chat or introduction to the press itself. Uh, as for my own knowledge, I've been following Gazal's work um, uh, with, the, with the press itself for the past, I would say, two years, maybe it's now three. Yeah. And I can just certainly say that I've been the witness of some absolutely fascinating, quirky uh, kind of progress, but also blossoming of... Um, uh, you finding, literally, it reminded me, I was teaching Sabal's Rings of Saturn yesterday to Miami students, and you know, there is the Sabadian map. Yeah. So you're kind of, the way you've mapped the, the writers you choose from, literally all over the world, reminded me of a mini Sabal map, but I think it's only me who understands this job, so don't worry. But nice way, the mapping is a nice way to put it, when, when you're dealing with uh, your vast geography. Because sure. it's, it, there is no, there, not, there seems to be no preference when it comes to geography or location. You have, over the past few years, really, in my eyes, impressively and miraculously grown into an international publisher based in London, yet still a small press. So this is the kind of thing I would like you to explain to us. For sure, yeah. yeah. And it's just to remind me, I think we, we worked... Uh, Many years ago, though, through your anthology of uh, wretched strangers, wretched strangers. yeah. Um, the, the, okay, so we met there. Actually. Yeah, that's right. That was two thousand. Yeah. That was two thousand and eighteen, and and even wretched strangers itself is going back to London because that's when I kind of first or second time met Jasper Job. Yeah, who's uh, actually I was talking the latest in yeah. the Pamanaria. So kind of Jessica Pujol Duran. So we've been tiptoeing around each other for many years, and it, and our paths been crossing now a few times, which is beautiful. But it's it's the kind of same roots of the international small underground scene of London. But then you've got writers from France, uh, Canada, uh, translation work, uh, etc. So so just. I'm speaking when you should be like. No, I I, I will too. I will. <laughs> I'm just I gonna just sit to, here. And... I need to I need to thank you first and and thank the Center for Poetry and Poetics, University of Sheffield, uh, and thank you everyone for for coming today. 
But yes, I will talk about Pomar. Can I sit down now? Or anywhere you want. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You're the professor here. I just I, I follow no your rules. No. Yes. They don't give it easy. Yes. <laughs> Pominar Press uh, was uh, founded in 2019. September 2019, we started. Uh, I remember there was a small launch in London, um, 28th of September 2018, and we started by a multilingual book by Carlos Soto Roman, who's a Chilean writer, lives in Chile. And uh, <clears throat> the book is, if I can find it here. Oh, that's Carlos's book. Uh, so this contains three little sections two in English and one in Spanish, uh, contains his visual poetry that he uses as performance scores and some uh, minimal English poets. So all I want to say that from the very beginning of starting Pominar Press, the ethos has been, have been to, to work with international writers, but not just for people being in different places, but um, while thinking about geographies also, having different languages. And, um, and we are thinking about translation. We have lots of uh, translation works published, but it's a broader view of, uh, you know, interpretive view on translation. So we have multilingual books uh, that are written in different languages. For instance, in um, a book that there was a collaboration, we encourage collaborations as well, uh, between Emma Gomez and uh, Anne Waldman. This book is written both in Catalan and in English. And uh, through letters uh, during the lockdown that uh, Anne Waldman and Emma Gomez wrote to each other. So starting with Spanish, English, then we move into also having some works that are, well, called, and I don't want to call it kind of experimental, but it was like kind of alternative uh, way of looking and publishing. We also have posters, uh, poetry posters published. And, um, but we took it from there. I think um, our ethos has been to uh, bring people together and uh, explore the language and geographies. While doing these books, um, we also thought of having a magazine, and I show you the online magazine. We try to post um, a poem uh, or a series of uh, poems, a poet uh, a week in this magazine. So we have like, I think over uh, 300 works uh, already published in our online magazine, and uh, it already works uh, like an archive of contemporary writing. And our idea over having an online magazine very closely related to translation has been, when we are thinking about translation, we are not only thinking about it textual. So it would be an opportunity for us to use this online venue to be able to incorporate sound and moving image. Uh, we have the sound of the original uh, language, the, the translation. We also have visual poetry here um, in the magazine. We have uh, film poems. Let me actually and then, of course, our uh, website is not the uh, most sophisticated uh, <laughs> to, to our... Uh, yes, yes, I was just uh, remembering Robert Hawk, who's not uh, with us anymore, Canadian, excellent Canadian poet. He was my professor 35 years ago. Is that right? Yeah, great guy. Great guy, and, and, and a great supporter for our, our press, because he always contacted me, gave me advice, and then even sent some uh, rare books to me as gifts. Uh, 
a very fantastic support uh, for us, very generous uh, person. And uh, well, this Pominar also have a little bit of Canadian side in it with me, myself uh, being Canadian and Iranian and uh, some of the people editors working with us uh, residing there, uh, Francis Crook, who's uh, our advisor, um, lives in Calgary, and Kes Mohammadi, who edits and, and now is uh, editing the magazine and helps with um, the press as well, is in Toronto. Uh, where am I just? I, I had this very interesting uh, video poem very early on. This is a performance, for instance, by uh, Edwin Torres that I recommend uh, people. Sorry, we just spotted mine. <laughs> and Barb's just spotted his. Uh huh. See, so we have great poets here, don't we? <laughs> oh, another of Robert. Uh, lot, lots of uh, people that we published earlier. Uh, uh, William Sherman's not with us. And we also lost uh, a big supporter, this uh, press, and a friend. Uh, four days ago, uh, Tyrone Williams passed away um, in the States, who, is, who has been an absolute... Uh, great support for the press and, and lots of young writers uh, he supported generously. It was uh, a review that uh, an intern working with uh, the Press just asked uh, Tyrone, just from the list, to know, could you please write a review on one of our books? And then he kept saying, oh, I'm very sorry, I will, I will. And then it was an... Uh, Susan Gewirtz's book. And then he's sending an email to me uh, that was saying that I really apologize. Now it's like he's head of department. Was he head of department at, at Buffalo? It's like very busy. And say, like, I'm very sorry. It's just, they, they cut it short. So it's just that much. So I was thinking that it's a paragraph of a review on uh, Susan Gewirtz's perhaps it was seven A4 pages. <laughs> Came with an apology that... <laughs> So this is, for instance, um, one of the usual poems in the magazine done by Peyman Hushman, so the Iranian photographer and writer living in Tehran. It's, um, oh, what did I do? It's much nicer on the website if you go because of the lights here. So anyways, if there's any questions about Pominar Press, I, I'm very proud that uh, there are uh, Pominar writers here who are my great friends and they're going to read today. I'm very grateful again, Aggie, for having us here. Um, all I can uh, conclude with is that without, uh, with the, uh, the magazine and the press, we are just seeking to empower voices that are, uh, it's, it's hard to say underrepresented because we're, we're not having that very under, I mean, we don't, we're not seeing in this light that someone is represented, but we are just looking for boundary pushing voices and wanting to empower them in a way that uh, I think young writers need this uh, 
confidence and need to um, have a, although very small press to, to give them this confidence that they don't need to confirm into a certain narrative uh, as to be accepted in, you know, any sort of narrative that they don't need to, they can uh, unite and think about creating new works together. Anything that I can answer about Pominar? So are you accepting submissions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're accepting submissions uh, for the magazine. It's unsubmittable if you go on the website. Um, Yes, uh, we are closed for the next uh, two years for some, because we're full. Uh, but then after that, yes. And I think our submission is usually through the dialogue uh, and back and forth. We are, uh, yes, yeah, keep, keep the dialogue and yeah, we're very happy to read new work. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, I know it's very difficult for small press to um to stay afloat uh in this in commercially speaking i'm just wondering if you say a little bit about that uh, whether or not uh you get any kind of i can't imagine you get funding certainly not from government but you, how do you actually manage to deal with the commercial pressures and the, and the costs and all the rest of it and whether or not can, can you get help uh deal with it no well, there's certainly uh plenty of help available but uh i'm actually a very bad model and youth are sitting here just don't look at me <laughs> but uh, yeah i don't have any funding uh from anywhere but uh but that uh but, but they are i think um i mean like the jazz person i sit here and think oh there are lots of funding available i just never applied for it but uh but but there must be support for someone yeah no for me i i uh, only uh, print books through book sale and I uh, participate in uh, different um, exhibitions and uh, book fairs and uh, Pominar sells books online on the website but also we are represented by the small press uh, distribution in the States and uh, University of Toronto uh, distribution in Canada. Uh, we are not on Amazon um and uh so yeah if uh i think over the seas overseas they can order from them but uh over here <clears throat> i don't have uh, a distributor i just send in touch with bookstores uh but then yeah it's i i don't recommend that if someone wants to start a press starts like me but this is a like, something really personal if i want to learn how something is done i'll never do it i, I just need to do things and uh and yeah, that happened. I didn't uh, mention uh, my designer, Hamid Jaberha, which is actually, uh, he's the pillar of uh, all press. He lives in Tehran and he's designed and uh, he does the typeset and everything. And also um, he has done the website and uh, it, it wouldn't have been possible to, to have a press without Hamid and all his uh, artistic input. Uh, Hamid himself is a visual artist and a book designer. Do you write poetry yourself? I write, and I, you know what? I'm here to read some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay. I, I just go right away. Okay. This is about the press, and this is like. So I'm now. I'm a different person. This is a poet here now. Uh, I will read. <laughs> I'm really not ready to read poems now. Uh, I've selected parts of a long manuscript uh, that is a uh, working title so far as um, Anders Nomen, 
which is a Persian title. This has been written uh, in Persian and is translated by Kes Mohammadi into English. And, um, and it's going to come out by Ugly Duckling Press uh, in New York in 2025. So I've just start right in the middle, but uh, a, a little explanation about the name and is uh, means advisory literature. And this is written in a style of uh, classical Persian advisory literature when uh, you just, you give lessons of life and then it's a combination of uh, prose and poetry. So, uh, it goes back and forth, so yeah, take it as advisory literature. If only I wasn't stuck so wretchedly in between one and all. If only we can write here without interruptions or adjustments. I also wish we weren't so ensnared in and all the roads to the inside and outside alike weren't severed this bad, without ambiguity and obliqueness, or even without asking ourselves if only we write properly what we've been doing from morning to night, we will surely reveal how empty this box really is. We are building scaffolds to hold water on top of water. It'll destroy itself, mark my words. In the end, our sharply construct of ourselves will destroy itself. The one which we think we have constructed in another's mind, which even if so, would still self-destruct. So now that we haven't, you'll see it'll implode without having ever been constructed. After all, not everything is malleable. I think it will break one day. And the malleable ones, on the other hand, I think, will crinkle terribly. The situation gets so dire that one day one opens one eyes to observe himself, say, whatever there is will be annihilated one day. And whatever has not yet been, but slowly grow, but it ruins and blooms into being and repeats. But whatever there was can never once again become. Sometimes one opens one's eyes only to see he hasn't aged enough to be an elder, but he's standing, but he's stating the obvious so profoundly and nodding as if it was he who had said it in the first place and no one else. I myself was lost in my own nebulous thoughts one day, walking to and fro, lost in the fugue, finding jewels in my dreams, holding them in my fist and dragging them to the precipice of reality by my teeth. A man with no arms went to bring water for the horsemen. I stand by my illusion and jibber jabber the same way that nobleman stood by the truth with the same perseverance. A man who was the moon, who was a lion, who was asked only to hold defense that day, who had some relevance to a kind of light, who was the scent of jasmine, who was sent to Euphrates to bring water for children, who was mounted on a horse. Let me say it this way, a moon lion mounted on a horse carrying a water skin, lost his hands to the enemies and so kept the water skin and his teeth never fell off. The horse before a spear struck the water skin with the same perseverance assigned to saints, I find myself persisting in illusion and jibber-jabber. I can't tell if the picture I'm seeing in the magazine is a day shrouded by smoke or a facet of a ship, wrecked at the hands of the sadistic turbulent sea, discolored and frantic, when the sea is disrupted, you can't tell it from any dust or storm or earthquake. Brown and gray, bleeding into one another. In fact, the entire world of turbulence is brown and gray. In the dust, 
The thighs of a portly woman are on the ground entirely stretched out. Two men who are alive possess her body and a heart is also visible, but nothing else is visible. Has someone died here perhaps? Should we be mourning? Shouldn't we have at least been informed of how such kerfuffle has ensued? Are you two the children of those portly thighs or just one of you? She has now laid prone. Is she perhaps vomiting from a plank of driftwood onto the sea? Or were you perhaps at home when an earthquake carried you here like this? If pictures were not taken, do you know how transient tragedies would have been? I myself have pricked the tip of my own index finger as I was swimming in the choppy waters of the Black Sea so exhausted, reaching out for the wooden steps of the jetty, a splinter pierced my hand. It came out on its own, and I survived this predicament, but survivors are, struck, are stuck in a bind too. I wish we could figure out, or even better, I wish they could figure out all that was in our intent but not all those who are our very enemies, but those who want to help. It would surely be nice if they could know properly what would have been done by now, but it was simply out of our hands. Let's skip apart. I'm mindful. And when it rains, I evade the puddles and suppress speech as if it were a sudden sneeze. My temples throb as if to implode, and then the throbbing dwindles. Speech and sneeze aside, even the floods eventually die down. If only we could know which one is true and which is false. Since we have suppressed a thousand words like a polite sneeze or words that are uttered and we regret saying them forever, those words are different from those those are words that, if truly possible, they wouldn't be so bad as to make us explode and say all that we should never say if it rained. At the right time, even if it rained a lot, it still wouldn't flood. And now that I list these examples, they seem simple and naive. But if the same was said by an elder, we'd all be impressed and said, how beautifully put. We don't get along with ourselves or our own epoch. We xenophiles, all of, our, all of our old poets are strangers. It's only us who exist visibly on the streets. The best part is that the entire story is broken. And even he, who is sat currently in the auditorium, he who was broken before, he is broken too. And we hear broken music. We are here. We are being heard. We didn't have to break the flower stem to let light pass through, to let light inside the stem pour out. We are broken perhaps because we've broken the stems. Even if we sit, we hunch over. Have you seen? Sometimes one is sitting. The summer and the window are there. The heat too. But also the breeze. The verdure of the trees is emphasized by the bricks, that too. And that the window is open. And there's also the fact that that she who saw a long strand of yellow tape on the haggard pine tree on the street and followed that golden path to the window sill of the building behind the pine, didn't see fit to pass by that image just as dusk had plucked it. She wanted to elaborate, to describe, she wanted to explain it to us, 
if she didn't have much to say on letting go or on self-restraint, we must confess she had truly messed with us all, insisting on visual explanation that I swear did not work. We were there too. We too are familiar with the interplay of light, with trees and buildings. We too have seen many such shapes. We have recognized if there was something there, or at least when she mentioned it, we'd shake our heads. We'd have added a point or two, but there was none, none. If we didn't add anything to what she claimed to see, we were respecting what we thought she was liberating. Upon the silence we held, we weren't adding words and letting it expand. But if there was nothing, if she alone easily observed a silver light upon objects and us all only saw a thousand sorrows hidden behind each word, she said, was it not us who summoned a certain misery in her and wished to witness the bound beast of our mind unleashed in hers? If we didn't see it, we didn't see ourselves either. If we didn't speak, we didn't speak of our own pain. But if we broke, we broke her. She was broken. She is broken still in long lasting, continuous light. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gazal. And the conversation with you is to be continued after the, the actual reading, so uh, it's not quite over yet. Um, we're going to move on to uh, the next guest, and our next reader, J.R. Carpenter. Just uh, an anecdote for you, J.R. I've been trying to hunt you down for the past sort of, uh, two, three years, but you were always somewhere, like. France or Canada or I don't know. So I was like, this is not going to be ever possible. And then suddenly, and suddenly on social media, there was the news that G.R. Carpenter is moving to Leeds. So uh, I was like, this, this is actually uh, 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 a miracle. So you're now literally a neighbor as well as a colleague-ish. Uh, so hopefully this is just the beginning of a, uh, of a conversation. So J.R. is here. Uh, uh, J.R. Carpenter is an artist, writer, researcher, and uh, also a lecturer at the University of Leeds. Her work asks uh, questions about place, displacement, migration, colonialism, and climate across performance, print, and digital media. Her hybrid print digital project, This is a Picture of Women, was listed in The Guardian's Best Poetry Books of 2020 and featured in the digital storytelling, storytelling exhibition at the British Library uh, 2023. JR's most uh, recent collection, The Pleasure of the Course, or Le Plaisir de la Côte, uh, was published by Pomona Press in, in, in 2020. 23, and I don't know quite what the plan is, uh, JR, but uh, the book is here and it's also on sale tonight. And I'm just going to read uh, um, a little passage uh, or fraction, fragment of one of the blurbs by our very beloved Erin Moray, uh, who writes, who is also a permanent poet, by the way, isn't she? Uh, who writes, J.R. Carpenter understands the writer as the one who plays with words in blocks from many sources, the one who moves words and makes them vibrate in a particular way without destination or anchor. She knows too that the author emerges when a public hears this vibration, meets and receives this writerly performance. There is no other writer I'd rather coast with them uh, J.R. Carpenter, and now I receive her authored words in two languages you can join to and receive and marvel. Um, and so on that note, 
the platform is yours and a very warm welcome to you, Jia. Thank you so much. I don't know if you remember, Aggie, but I also had work in The Wretched Strangers. Okay, I do remember, but it's it was, a bit of a blur. It is a bl bit of a blur. Um, and that seems like a really long time ago. Um, I know this is a Pominar event, but I wanted to start um, by mentioning an earlier work. Uh, Aggie asked us to talk a little bit about how we work and how we do things. And I do things in a very... Uh, what often seems like a roundabout way, maybe to others, but to me, it's, <laughs> this is how I do things. So um, I often start very small and I start with, um, I often start with a zine. So I wanted to talk about this as a picture of wind because it turns out that it, there's a huge Sheffield based critical mass that went behind making um, uh, this work. So in 2014, there were some massive storms in the southwest of England, pictured here for any of you unfamiliar with that far south, um, where I was living at the time. And um, I had only been in the UK for about five years and these storms were so huge. They were the first thing that made me feel like I was here, you know, that I um, was part of a landscape and an environment. Um, I made a zine. I often start with zines. In so many of my projects have started with a zine or have a zine really early on. And the zine was this shape. I don't know why, but this, it was a poem that had months and the months looked like this. They were small rectangles. I think I read a lot of almanacs as a child at some point. I'm a big fan of the almanac form. And it's also cylindrical, the calendar shape, this small rectangle. And I immediately had it in my head that I wanted to do a digital version. I've been working with web-based um, projects since um, the mid-1990s. And I usually do everything myself, but in this um, instance, I was very aware that there was a thing that I really did not know how to do, um, which was that I wanted to call live wind data into the poem. And so I enlisted the help of my friend Kay Lack, who's here. She was living in London when we worked together, but had the good sense to move to Sheffield. Um, and so is now based in um, Sheffield. Um, so the piece knows that it's March, because uh, uh, Kay um, made the piece know that. So it, it's arrived at March and the blue texts are month related. So mist, that's a March word. Um, and uh, stormy, a March word. And then this line below uh, where it says warmth, for example, waves breaking white. Well, it's very windy in Plymouth at the moment. This is the live wind speed for Plymouth right now is um, 20 miles an hour. So all of those um, lines that are above the wind speed are determined by the current wind speed. Um, so I wanted to uh, write about weather, but I wanted the weather to participate in the writing about weather. Um, and then I also like read, you know, a huge amount of English poetry about weather and literature about weather. So the piece incorporated a huge amount of um, um, uh, poetic language, especially in these blue texts from John Clare through um, Gilbert White. Gilbert White and I have the same birthday, I'm just saying. We <laughs> We take a lot of notes and, um, uh, but I also, so I work a lot with archives is what I'm getting at. And I work with, um, you know, poetic text as found text as archive as totally pillageable. Um, but I also work with um, non-poetic text like weather data. It's all fair game to me. Um, so just to say a few things about this piece, it has multiple years of wind so it scrolls um, horizontally and um, vertically, again, thanks to Kay. Um, and so you can follow along a year as a whole year, um, but you can also look at um, time, look at other years. So the top year is based on writing that um, I did when I was living in Devon 
Um, this, uh, this year is based on some weather observations, historical weather observations by Luke Howard, who's the man that gave the clouds the names they have today. Um, the bottom year is Vita Sackville West's writing on gardening. And um, uh, anyway, so I, I uh, with Kay's help, made this piece. And um, you would think having this, I'd be very happy. But no, I decided we needed a book. And um, I had the good sense. I think I just, I think I sent Brian Lewis <laughs> the zine in the, in the post. That's how I approach most things. And um, Brian Lewis of Sheffield fame, um, Long Barrow Press, um, uh, made this beautiful book version that um, uh, retains the, t the shape of the, of the poems. And the web version as well retains the shape. So it's been this long thinking through, um, through forms, whether it's the zine or the digital project um, or the book work. And so this, this is kind of how I think through things. Um, I'm not going to read from this piece, but um, I wanted to give it as a precursor because now I'll talk about the um, Pominar book, which follows um, oddly, although less Sheffield based, a very similar um, kind of trajectory. So in uh, 2018, maybe, I was invited by, I was commissioned by a research group uh, at the Université Paris 8 uh, uh, in partnership with the Archive Nationale in Paris. So if you work with archives enough, eventually archives start to invite you to work with their archives. I'm just saying, it's, it's a strategy. And uh, so I lived in Montreal for 19 years. I speak French and I read French, but I don't write in French. And um, I... So I was working with a visual archive of a late 18th century French hydrographer. Um, I work with a lot of nautical themes and again, these sort of weather themes. And um, uh, so all of the images that you will see in this piece come from the archives of a, a chap called Charles-Francois Beauton Beaupré, who was a contemporary of Beaufort. The, the English Beaufort. So uh, there was a kind of late 18th century trend in naming everybody Beau, Fay Beau. It's good weather. Um, but I needed to write the text, and I, I don't really speak, I don't write in French. So um, Beauton Beaupre had written a manual for, he basically invented. Um, uh, the system for making coastal measurements that we still use today. He was a he was a big deal back in the day, um, uh, and that had already been translated into English. Um, but he was he was this text comes from and these images come from a colo a very colonial voyage. You know, French colonialism. <laughs> what, you know, where where do I go with that? So I. Um, I used the text of um, Roland Barthes, The Pleasure of the Text, but I replaced the word text with coast. The Pleasure of the Coast. Um, so that detournement uh, made, uh, intermingled with the scientific writing of the hydrographer, imbued the scientific writing with a kind of libidinal, you know, it, it removed the idea of an of a objective um, text and made it into a much more subjective text. And then, um, but that was like a lot of dudes. And I wanted, I often wind up recycling language that was written by, you know, dead scientific men. So I wanted to bring a, a, a female voice into it. And uh, there's an obscure novel by Jean Giraudoux, who's a very famous French uh, author, but he's much more famous as a playwright. But um, he early on wrote a novel called Suzanne and the Pacific, Suzanne and the Pacific, and uh, in which a young French woman gets cast ashore. She wins a trip around the world and gets shipwrecked on an island in the region of the South Pacific where Charles-Francois Beauton Beaupré was charting uh, 250 years before coincidence. Um, and so I used the language from the three French texts and their three English translations 
Um, so I was sort of reading in English and selecting texts and then finding it in French and then um, mixing all of the, the um, languages up in creating this kind of tripartite language system. I'm sorry, that's a long explanation. I figure that if I keep doing events for this book, it might get shorter, but it's, it's, a, it's a complicated bit of mixing that went on under the text. Um, so what I'm gonna try to do to keep things complicated is um, read from the uh, book in English whilst showing the French text on screen. I don't know if anybody um, speaks French, but um, this is the way I want to do things. And the other thing that I want to um, point out where I shall start the reading is um, with this page. And Kay may notice that I um, borrowed the source code from, <laughs> um, you'll see this um, calendrical structure. Um, and this is totally, you know, like, um, uh, why, why, you know, why waste good source code just using it for one piece? I recycle. Um, so it's it's pretty solid. Huh? You might find that jaggy, but um, that janky thing that you fix, I just realized. I don't know if it's still in here. Anyway, so it also knows that it's March, um, and I am not going to start with March because that would be, that, that's not how books work. Um, okay. On me présente un côte. La côte me choisit. J'appelle simplement un souvenir circulaire l'impossibilité de vivre hors la côte infinie. I am offered a coast. A coast chooses me. I summon simply a circular memory. The impossibility of living outside the infinite coast. The coast must prove to me that it desires me. This coast, this proof exists. It is the coast. Quel coast? What coast? Des exemples? Some examples, at least. What I enjoy in a coast is not directly its content or even its structure, but rather the abrasions I impose upon its fine surface. I seat myself by the sea, drawing it gently toward me. I read, I skip, I look up, I dip in again. I foresee, I explain, I draw, I impose. I make a horizontal plan in order to recollect such minute details as sketches might not clearly explain. Thousands of unknown birds flutter around me like a new language. You are going to be disappointed. I cannot tell you the name of these marvels. As soon as I name, I am named, caught in the rivalry of names. Um, I'll leave off that passage for now and um, go to another page. So the um, uh, part of the arrangement with the Archive National is that they digitized some materials for me that were um, uh, you know, they'd been lying in this archive for a few hundred years and nobody had really um, <coughs> looked at them. Okay. So um, this long uh, thing that you're about to see is a sketch. And in this archive, I really wanted to work with the sketches. He made a beautiful finished atlas engraved, you know, uh, um, even so, it wasn't um, it wasn't perfect, but that's a very sort of colonial enterprise to try and pinpoint this thing. So I was looking for everything messy, everything subjective, everything before it's pinned down. 
Between the ship and the key lies two meters of incomprehensible ocean. Two meters of light between the edge of the sea and the horizon. Our labors commence at sunrise and do not end until nightfall. Every precaution is taken to guard against errors. By calculations that I check every day, I arrive at the exact number of months I will have to endure this island before a ship is sent to search. Already, I am cramped by these small divisions of time. The coast establishes a sort of islet within the common human relation. The months leave their notches on me. The island has no need of me. You want something to happen and nothing happens. What happens to the coast does not happen to the discourse. Like a cork on the waves, I remain motionless. Boredom is not far from bliss. It is bliss seen from the shores of pleasure. Those who have never been afloat cannot be aware of the inaccuracies rising from the slight errors that creep into charts. On a rock that dominates the sea, a meter is divided into centimeters. The Pacific could measure could be measured on it to within a millimeter. Carved in letters of five centimeters in height, the beginning of a phrase. I am, je suis. Um, I have to, I need about four hands to read this book, I realized. <laughs> um, I, I want to explain something about these, um, these islands. So I was looking at the sketches and um, I, there are many, 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 many sketches of sea charts and um, they look a lot like this one, for example. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> um, and you see these little islands and they all have letters next to them. So to me, this was this sort of linguistic underpinning of some kind of colonial endeavor to, to map uh, and chart these tiny little islands in the South Pacific. And um, uh, Jean-Francois Bautin Beaupre had this system for numbering the islands um, and lettering them. So I collected every image that I could find of every tiny little island in every sketch. And I made a font with them. And it's a variable font. It keeps changing. So all the D's, all the E's. Um, and then I used it to write uh, throughout the piece. So, you know, an answer to my own question is about what am I supposed to do about French um, imperialism? The only thing I could really contribute was to um, mess it up. <laughs> this was to disorder and, and um, um, uh, discombobulate it. Um, so I, I don't want to um, uh, go on too long, but I want to um, uh, finish with this, um, this page. The, uh, the ship that uh, Botan Beaupre was very young, like Darwin, you know, these, these young guys going off to make their fortunes. And the captain of the ship was called D'Entre Castel, and the voyage was meant to be searching for another um, voyager who'd become lost, La Perouse. Um, and uh, so the ship that they sailed on was called La Recherche, the searcher the search, the research. Um, so <clears throat> I could 
I could and have given lectures about this in relation to practice-led research, because anyway, La Recherche. And so there's an island somewhere in the South Pacific called La Recherche. Ce n'est pas vrai. It is not true that a ship passed one morning within a few miles and I had nothing ready to make a sign. Ce n'est pas vrai. It is not true that I wanted to starve then, that I spread my body in the water to die also of drowning that I left my head out of the sea to die also of sunstroke, that I thought of all that is basest and lowest in the world to die also of indignity, that I opened all the deaths around me like gas pipes, and I waited. Ce n'est pas vrai. It is not true that I used my days to sand my legs, to rub them with a mother of pearl powder that rendered them silver. Ce n'est pas vrai. It is not true that I kissed a platypus. I rummaged through her pockets and I found nothing. Now you know everything. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Val. I mean, I would like to come next now to read, but that's, that was absolutely fascinating and fantastic. I don't know. Is everything okay? And I was just going to uh, say that. Uh, so our next reader is Safa Fatih, and I didn't know Safa's work at all until uh, Ghazal started introducing me to her work. Um, and then I met up with Denise Riley, who also started talking about Safa Fati. So I had like Ghazali in one year and then Denise Riley and then and, then, and I got hold of the book. In fact I got the book. Can also show the book to the audience if they want because this is like is everyone leaving now or am I just yeah. talking to myself? <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean I really like Safa's book, you know, guys. <laughs> It's yeah, just, yeah, just just about the production of the book. Yeah. Because uh, when we were doing this, Safa is also a film director and, and filmmaker. Uh, she has made many cine poems and documentaries. Uh, there are, I think, uh, if you go to her bio on Pominar, you can also uh, go to a link that this poem is based on, um, Hidden Valley. And we also have a QR code and these are images from the the movie that are inside the book. Um, there's also a QR code in the in the book that you can just download the film or go directly to the page that film is. But uh, one of the yes, bless you. Uh, <laughs> it is very cold in here. I can yeah I feel it. Cold, yeah. So yes, yeah, so the, uh, again, our designer, Hamid uh, Jabir had decided that it would be nice to have stills from that film inside the book. Um, now, Safa, no, come here. I was just, because you weren't here, I just jumped in and explained okay. a little bit about, uh, and then one very interesting editing point about this book that I mentioned that you're launching as well. I need to introduce you first. Safa sent me the, a document of this book it was a little glitch that the lines were slightly sliding on each other it was it was center justified but not exactly so I just really liked it and I talked to her we decided to make all the lines kind of a tiny bit you can't see it but it's just enough to make you uncomfortable <laughs> off center so it's like they slightly sliding on each other all the lines when you look at it 
And the book being Galahash is you must feel you are on something <laughs> reading it. So, Although it does have nothing to do with the hashish itself. Yeah, no, 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 no. Can I have my book back? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I have put your book on the students' reading list, and I was a little bit worried, like, <coughs> if, if I'm going to get into trouble, but not so far, I haven't yet. But I need to introduce you, but you just stay there comfortably. Okay. Uh, while <laughs> I, I introduce you. Sit. <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit awkward because you know who you are, but these guys don't know who you are. So uh, Safa, uh, again, is one of the writers who I've been trying to find. And I kind of was, in, it was getting, sort of giving really up the hope because you were always somewhere else, like literally on a different continent every time I try to pin you down. But anyway, you're here. Thank you. Um, Safa Fati was born in Egypt. She's a poet, essay writer, and filmmaker. She had her PhD from Sorbonne University and has been director of program at the Collège International, International de Philosophy, uh, Paris. Her plays, Terror and Ordeer, were uh, prefaced by Jacques Derrida, yeah. with whom, that's absolutely awesome, with whom she signed a book. Tony Le, Le Mans, partly translated into English by Max Cavitch, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Safa Fatih's book of poetry, Revolution Goes Through Walls, was first published in Egypt, then in France, and then in Brazil. Her experimental book of poems entitled Al Hashish is published by Pamela Press. Uh, it's again here on, on, on the store today in, from, uh, in 2023. Where Not to Be Born is published by Litmus Press in New York. Uh, Name to the Sea, a film poem structured within a still frame, is being published along with the text in seven languages. Uh, and Fatih's work has been uh, has been uh, writing a novel in English for the past five years now. And I really wanted to read a little bit of the book, but I think I'm just going to let you get out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to bore people more than that. Uh, well, thank you for for being there. Thank you for inviting me again. Uh, it has been hard work for you to try to gather us uh, together and make us cool inside in this place, in this beautiful center, which you know, I really admire. I admire the work and I admire the presence. Thank you for being there late <laughs> uh, with all these weird people doing weird things. <laughs> Um, I am one also, you know, it's also an, a, a linguistic uh, kind of adventure in my book. Um, it's, uh, for some reason, I decided to, I like etymology a lot, you know, trying to find the origins of words and things. And uh, so we went in the etymology of the word that hashish in Arabic. And all of a sudden, uh, in fact, it, it just became like uh, um, a garden. A garden or a forest full of plants, full of uh, kind of make you dream and travel in, uh, in space and and in time as well. And uh, and I said, what if I make in each plant a poem? Each each type of plant or hashish. Hashish is a plural word, and uh, the the singular is. Hashisha. So, um, so I found, you know, all these groups of plants, different, you know, this botanical experience, uh, which is also metaphysical, um, kind of opened lots of doors for me. So uh, I structured the whole book on that. Meanwhile, I was filming, uh, filming in the United States, Joshua Tree, uh, filming in Mexico, filming in the south of Spain filming everywhere, and uh, I don't know how uh, the film uh, got structured around the, the kind of, um, yeah, chapters, these botanical chapters, and uh, I tried to put as many plants, uh, strange plants, in the film as possible. The f I think the film can be found in the uh, Paminar uh, website. Uh, and uh, Hamlet's genius decided to extract pictures of the film and add them like this uh, into the book. 
uh, which made the book a, a very expensive book because the production is really, really beautiful, perfect. Um, so that the book is kind of mapped through its kind of um, hidden structure by, by these strange images taken from the film. So if you have time, you know, you know, have a look. It can be uh, interesting. Now I read extracts from the book, and I will give the title of each hashisha. So this one is called Hashisha of the Salamander. It's a plant and a bird tongue. Open the book three times at random, the last time six times. The answer traces the passage that closes the pages, opens the book, the return of a cut, against another passage in the rock, the night buried within me. In the early morning of things, I had the gestures of the ordeal. A woman crawls in weight and oblivion, ocean trench, where detaches itself the red silhouette of yesterday. Alone, you close your door after the night that flow over the banks, even on marble. In a giant heart, where I lay my pirated days, Merano, don't you see the hereafter? Look at the cities, Toledo, Lisbon, Coimbra, Algiers, Cairo, or do you sojourn in the belly or an Easter pomegranate next to a cat sparkling in the courtyard? Where did you travel? At the third sun rises the brazenness, the fury in Marie Curie's insight, in the name of the hunger, of a salt tree, of a fulminating desert, of the drool of time. And convent brings you the bread needed in the night that still drags the witness to the corridors, to the starred floor, dive. The mirror restrains me on the edge of the faint face. When will these tears release you from earth? Viviendo. De vez en cuando, untie your tongue, certainly feet, just as flayed. Wherever I am for you, the black milk and the almond milk, for you the fungus that shelters me. Not from from here lies this body where you duplicate life, little metal box, wooden box, another in plastic, strand of hair in black and white, bursting with water wards at night, in the antechamber of the Condesa, wash with stone, with rose water, the first name of before your number is a flower that closes the windows the streets and the journey on foot lock gate was golden silvery serpentine my mother had given me to the convent caminanda caminando caminanda caminando 
the religion fruit, the fruit, things, covered flesh, closed over a sap, foreign. It is genetic. A cell reigns, a cell weeps, and a genome plays the evil genie. Find the leg of Avenue, the joy of Minya, the pause in the East, the summer loose in Paris, the jumble and jostling of London, places that carry me in the station, in the halt of you. They were afraid. You were phantom. Black silhouette, bubble shrieking silence, bushed onto roads of solitary paths. She was dark out of nowhere. I am on the route of buried remains that the pulverized lateness flowers, a gaffs grow from the future. The veil is one with the skin in vacuum pleasure. Only you can see it. Yes, pleasure. I, I share, you share, we share the earth. Hashisha of the angel, angel wild and cultivated plant. Detour, Dar Vuelta. Imagine the machine, the layer, the rainmonger, the red silhouette, cherries on the feet, cherries in images, frail pomegranate, tree collapsing with fruit, papayas that make the side fall, towards the sun, the banks, the seams, the sass, salacious, the keen to grow over trails, solstice in elevators, churches, temples, mosques, touches stolen from the warda, typing mistakes, days held back, Nowhere else, gush, gush, spur. Day cheeks, henna tents. The stem field vanished, a wave in just the sand at the window sun. Or father gift, or sworn fear. Inedible fruit, barely trees, under penalty of a tree, mouth shut to the eyes, doors, the mirada. But Mira, Mira, and he doesn't look, doesn't follow, return to the named place on pain of death, death of me, on the edge of the Pacific, on the edge of a hopeless sofa, on the verge of suicide, or by love, the heart didn't stop. When one day at the edge of alliance, mosquitoes scratch the other heart and he says, or she says, she swallowed her coffee like a ravenous conscience, becomes immortal line, intonses, intonses. What's happening? Hallucinating his laugh, his fingers, his black, his back, his eyelashes, with a thousand shooting eyes. By mistake, for many years, by shared mist beds, in the antechamber of the Condessa, in the antechamber of the Condessa, captive she is. On every street corner, someone is waiting for me. Avoid your step. Avoid your step. Turn around, 
go up this long lens of the biopsy, a night or night strike, or else the day of the eclipse, a rotating bird, or a plucked parrot lording over the cage and pierces the tunnel of the friend we will get by in sand. Dawn still, asked, said, head under this skin, or when the head implored the feet, saving took hypnosis root that save us, that save, that if that had been true, only if it was true, in a taxi, go along the Champs Elysees, <coughs> the solar disk blocked the road. The Messiah awaits, the profondis learned from profondis. Or perhaps Elohim, Elohim, Lema Sapaktani. Yes, Elohim, Lema Sapaktani. My neighbor, my failed face, swollen with eluded days, days of I don't want to, of that voice that throws twice to the heavens while waiting for the angel I had seen, that very beast who rose from the abyss to meet his end. She who is and is no more in the July wheat, in the sunflower passes, in the blackened skies, through prism of your hands and your birthday. You hear me? Cyrus did the prayer walk you during the hours of your sliced belly. Sew it up, close it, sprinkle it with orange water from my hands to give it back to the hand. That's when I have no more hands. Hands cut off for theft. The four continues to fall. The side lane, the stone alley that leads to here lies my road. Body against earth and the sun is watching or rather Three lightning flashes that rise that remains on front of witnesses, secret salt water of these eyelids glued, those white lips, how many hearts overwhelmed me, carried away by the December winter when I could sign no more since my name became missing. If there is ash, there is. It would be rain blowing celestial, evaporated in noise, in silence, in motion. Caminanda, caminando, caminanda, caminando. Starts on exiting this road, this black van carries the road, the alley, the good tomorrow. In what sky, eyes fixed on the veil of your mirada. The seven of strata celestial Moses was able to talk to the fulminating soul here below. Cover a date with a beautiful fur, with capsules of facts, with marine gestures, with lianas of words, roots that deplore the flight, hanging gray breasts in chameleons at the corner of the four, uh, the corner of the four farewell, dodge the bullet entering the net. It pierces the hereafter, the inaccessible just. Smokers die young. 
Of whom are we talking of a vox ontological? When she says tumor, tumors dropped anatomical, fallen into the slit or on the crack made in the earth's face, countless deaths burst from the heart of nights of vigilance, how many, too many times, and a valley, river with no name, where my days do flow. A bubble, palligentia, transmigrate, sway, swap, sign, swans murmur the water of the Anacolusa, a house overcomes the back, erect, elongated, curved, where I live, the bower spreads this ball of rays and your smoky gaze will vault on a hair blow above the always wax Siamese of wood of madrugada of rose in a sea of joy of this blissful desert in wool in une fois pour toutes perle les dents assoiffées. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Steph. Uh, that was absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I'm so glad we've got a recording. So, uh, And it was also so cool that you were just sitting here as well. Really nice. So moving on, uh, our final reader and guest today is uh, Frank Locke. Um, just an anecdote. Uh, I didn't know your work until we met uh, about a year ago when we read together. Um, and Fran was the last reader like today. And she literally hijacked the whole reading. <laughs> that was just absolutely amazing. So you <laughs> you blew my mind then. Uh, and ever since, uh, I just hope that you can read for us here uh, in Sheffield. So moving on to introducing Fran. Uh, who, is the, who is the author of numerous chapbooks and 13 poetry collections, most recently A Disgusting Lie, uh, Further Adventures Through the Neoliberal Hellmouth, uh, that came out in 2023 uh, by uh, Pamela. A friend was the Judith uh, e. Wilson Poetry Fellow at Cambridge uh, in 2022-23, researching federal subjectivity through the lens of the medieval bestiary. A collection of hybrid essays based on her research, titled Vulgar Errors, Federal Subjects, was published by Outspoken Press last year. Um, Fran is a commissioning editor and made of her work at the Radical Arts and Culture Cooperative Culture Matters. Um, and just an additional line here by Fran, she hates the Tories and all who sails in them. She lives in Kent. Huge welcome. Hello everyone, hello. Um, thank you so much for having me and I must apologize because we've had translators and intellectuals and archivists and artists and now you've all got me. I'm really very sorry. So as well as um, researching um, feral subjectivity through the lens of the medieval vestry, I like to think what I was doing is also a bit of social anthropology, observing middle-class English people, um, faculty members, students, and surrounding, and I have lots of poems about that. So I'm just gonna read them. Um, 
it won't be good, it will be quick because I've had like eight coffees today. So <laughs> they'll love you when you're, and this is something that somebody on the faculty said, I was talking about, you know, the difficulty um, of women to sort of be taken seriously as artists and to establish any sort of legacy and longevity. And he kind of put his hand on my on my shoulder. He's like, oh, well, they love you when you're dead. And so that's what gave this poem its title. They'll love you when you're dead. Erased and multiplied, the poems pile up, a tube of chalky sweets engraved with lovesick dispensations, and the poems pile up. Here we go again, do you like it? Its mouth is dark and full of novelty. They'll love you when you're a compendium of heaving rain and flip phone aesthetics. Filters affect some the fossilized summons the dread sensitivities. Hey, knelt on a pile of rocks before the statue of the saviour, did you? Yellow light through a glass decanter all day long, well, bully for you. Anxiety, the article and expression of my faith. When I said, dickhead, you're not a comrade, you're a tourist, and I meant it. Excavate the spacious hood, lift a face up to the light, it's yours, it's you. Human but humorless, know what I mean, a confederate monument draped to the flag, the body. I will be pregnant with nothing but possibility. And not much of that. You, boy men with faces like the clip art logos for artisanal cider, interchangeable bros of early promise, browns, and I meant it. You, yes, you, flat foot, slap head, cook head, plate shirt, shit, you, full sleeve on a sack of associate pay, you can't laugh, it's all right. You, cargo pants and camel jacket, rebox rubric, you, rhetorician, this dancing opens decay. You, yes, you, you superficialites, you're not a etc. you're a growth mindset with a fringe, you're a carefully husbanded nicety, a smugly privatised phrase. This is the kingdom, do you like it, of coots and codgers, men, boys and old men with a lifetime ban from Greg's true story. The kickabout skulls they strove to stove in at half time. All the keepy uppy faces of sanction restructure. Here, with the heightened mutability of fetish and the snuff potential of mere visibility, and you and you and you, your prefab pride, your sticky wet rainbow turned on like a faucet. Yes, I am talking to you, you beautifully proportioned incels, you gutless mediagenics patent our deathbeds with a tasteful font. Meanwhile, the pharmacopoeia's savage parenthesis closed around the Latin for this malady of anchors will cauterize identity with source until I am a museum of fair demonics. This sickness, cancer's expansion is prattle the neat white lows of enclosure, bits of me under the microscope, micro scraped and very finely sliced. They'll love you when you're congealed and leaking, well-meaning dullards accelerate enlightenment. There's a difference between the mindful and the full mind. You softly censoring prefix, you strobo to cliches of managed decline, you classicists, you classists, you manila folder full of fucking invoices, you broadhead contract, you wide receiver, you agents, accountants, you legally binding deadbeats, you mandarins of language. Here is a collected works, ambitious little maxims, a soggy date stamped farce. So, so, so of your lacrimal analogy, cursor moves over an encrypted dream. It's a told mode, it's a method of thought, it's a poem, ta-da, do you like it? Look, you dream in circles and downtown container park rebrands and contactless payments and frictionless sharing streaming the flat white into your open mouth. You gob on expenses, you pate on expenses, you, well, respecting the flesh, let our shadow be your star. We are the peasantry and we are revolting. Everyone laugh at the funny joke. Despair is our best tradition, is our only political tradition, but we are not rolling back. We are now when we are made of now when we are only ever now. The black ram, the buried ram, the throbbing dirt, and you, the very hearse of rhapsody. You'll love us when we're silently assumed, sublime inside the insult of your expenditure, exchange, obituary, kudos. Dead, said we won't be dead. Free, bird a blade dishing the raw wind. So um, I'm gonna read a poem, this is, um, so I also have these little kind of evening pages things, um, the kind of interlocutor for these is a figure who is kind of based on my mom and also based on every therapist I ever have, like I tell them things, um, just to horrify them mostly. <laughs> and this is I'm talking about my dreams and this one's a dream, this doesn't really happen, it's a dream. This is an important thing to bear in mind, I'm actually lovely. <laughs> It's not a pendant, it's an amulet, I said. The way my face hangs off my head, I meant. In the dream, I have murdered my enemy, 
but now I have to use her body to stage an elaborate farce a weekend at Bernie's, which is Pete's favourite film, but the eye snob that I am have never actually seen. I ache to resolve the problem of her body. I put her in a witch elm. I put her in with the mixed recycling. I put her on a hot wash. I squeeze her through the slit in the suggestion box. I attempt to donate her to the Salvation Army's winter clothing appeal. I tie her up outside the patent office and leave her there. I raffle her off at the local pub. I swap her for the unauthorised biography of Alistair Darling. I push her with considerable force up through the flap in a venting machine. I padlock her to a neat set of Victorian railings directly adjacent to a sign that says not under any circumstances to padlock your bike to the neat set of Victorian railings. I fold her really, really, really small and hide her in a library book. I submit her to Granta. I hand her in at the local police station during its quarterly knife amnesty. I attempt to convince a group of stoned teenagers in the park that they can roll her up and smoke her. I take her to Battersea Dogs Home in a box marked Misk. I tie her to a horse's tail. I shove her into the exhaust pipe of Jeremy Clarkson's 4 before. I enter her into the Turner Prize. I take her to the customer service desk located in the menswear department of the big John Lewis in Canterbury. I leave her unattended on the station concourse. I record a haunted video of her dragging herself from a well and slip the curse tape to a journalist. But she is fucking everywhere. And in every fucking copy of the Evening Standard, the quick crossword grid is filled up with her name. All the worm casts of catastrophe and the blunt stink of her under the bed. Man, it hung around for days. Um, so I'm going to read some poems from this hot mess now. It's a wonderful thing indeed. I've got to be careful with this because it's not actually my copy. So my niece travelled down with me and then she ran off with my copy of the book. Not because she loves it, because she didn't know she had it. And when she finds out she's got it, she'll probably nail it to a frisbee and fling it over the rainbow. Um, this is a poem, it's called, it's called Hedge Born. And through the feely twilight go on legs of splinted leather, skirt of mayo, coat of plates, bracers, cooters, facets, folds, you watch yourself. Might how you go, we're feral here, we fend our moloch gulkets, petiola, spindle, bitch of prick and swell. Call us ragwort jacquery, scourge apple, sorby, fickle thorn. Some girls have truck with honey sweet as bletted meddlers, never us, not us, this curfewed and encircled night. The romance of a winding path to gilded gaffs among the nettle beds. Boys with eyes like skinned green grapes, gawping, gaping, gropes of stucks and mantles, siacitos, venus and ozone of wanting spines. Mind, we mind us own. The bladed rose through fought these mornings grows, her literal defects, lilting doom, a casual fuck on its thistle down a tinder tryst, a trick, your snout is drowned in truffles, us the kiss, the kiss, the cyst, kicking your chase shocks to the curb, now you're girt in the gilder's regard, teasing the season of tyranny, fire, a sectarian stain in the shape of your country, whore words impaled upon your underlip, putterill, cunny, bunny girl, the wiles of vaunting foxes, us, of natal hawthorn, devil's sticks, and through the felty twilight creep, Gandhi lions are downy lepers, this culvert, covert, vulvar, ditch, a subtle grave, we crawl, we leap. Pet the bones out of that one, and you're on good time. The human suit goes walking. Because I don't know about you, but I sort of, I have this idea that in my head, this is just, this is just a meat suit, this isn't a real person. A real person is some sort of gargoyle abomination, which will come kind of like, you know, hyena kind of, no? <laughs> okay, I have said too much. I thought we were making friends, I thought we were having a moment, no. Never mind. It's a finite period of time that will eventually end, don't worry. The human suit goes working, by which I mean this feeling device, software, the capable hole, this suffering jacket, her gaunt booty canted, a rosy machine. The hot normal is the whore's arbor, the vacuum that nature abhors is livid fish eye, stink eye, spit roast, night shift, night shaft, the perforated cherry supply fingered. Disaster glues the gilded wet of her in place, the world unbraiding its fait accompli, one intestine at a time. Funny how. A pillow slip filling with wet feathers, a line of pastel sparrows sewn together, rose decals in hygienic motels. The world grows a girl on it like mould, ten eyes oinking, men coquetting their hard on through a hole in the sheet, through a slit in the wall, men with scented bayonets, the pig part is sticking. The human seek to be hospitable, dismantled, run. See how many glowing shanks on the pyre. Once her lulled on a gurney, once a chaser of tar to seal the speaking wound in her back, in her life, in her flame retardant nighty, in her temple garments, look. 
sucking the sauce from the spare rib she is whittled from, disgusted, the ash of her pale aniseed. He has finally reached the limits of the edible. I'm going to have a poem. So this is a poem that was originally called Gremlins, but my mother, who in the absence of a dog, because we're currently between dogs at the moment, in the absence of a dog is my eternal muse, my mother said I have to call it reputational risk um, and that I have to dedicate it to the Arts Council. And she called them something else, but I won't say what that is. <clears throat> We want axioms, maximum sky, not you. An immobile romantic, a sea of romantic immobiles, that detestable animal, the lyric I. Politely standardised sentimental suck-ups, their weak verbotens over everything. Now we identify as knives and why not? Tell me again, it's a basement phrase, it's a rip-off song off key. Yeah, you wish your girlfriend was a freak like me. Yeah, you wish you were me, you cursory radical, you bystander, you passerby, you citizen. You spoke and you spoke and every syllable was safety. You and your fiction of Smiths, your Smith committee, the followers who have replaced your friends. Yeah, you wish. And the folk art fracas of my, my, my multiple choice collapse, blacklist and block capitals. Reputational risk, you dullard, you sullied little hedonist, you verse chorus chief of absolute boredom. All oh, the white ship booze cruise banter of you, you branch secretary, you polytendral parody, you vampire squid of organised whoopee. You chairman of traditions, you slow burn salute, you canned Nazi, you novelist. We are into rudiments, discord, not you, spectre of consensus, spectator, exhorter, the extorted sex of you. We were coming apart like cedar at a sawmill, syllabus of straw men, scarecrow, mock, scarecrow, shuffle, modernists, those self-styled destroyers neither adapt nor resist, have distilled shit creek into shtick for a fee. We are into rudiments, discord, not this, a drudge Jerusalem for cackling aspirants, not you, generational renegade, vacated and sane, catchphrase franchise, melodic indie vibes off you, cog in your lopsided uniform, the uniform obeyed of middle-aged, all in all a brick in the blockhead parade. We are here with the Orac, Charlock, Couchgrass, Stitchboard, Collateral, Jacket of Weeds, Outcast, Slouches, Slang, we've got a my, a my, a my, impure probation of thoughts and you wish... For these non-stop hands for a shapeless psychosis knocked into song, the grit in a sensitive instrument refined and transfigured mania without centre or margins. You wish, whose sneer is a needle, you wish, confirmed grace crudely cruising, crudely shining, zippered and cinched into cliché, the wheedling blag of your affirmations, fake northern slang evangelist, knocked into appropriate phobias, knocked into queasy teeth, grit in the gut, crack pot pariah, crack rock rap, defiance over the headland, they will remember you, hallmark minions, appropriate adults in chin strokes, symposiums, these agit avant urgent, ethereal deliriums, dead interjectionists, castrated scallywag syntax saints, we want a militant rictus, words nailed into utopia, wipe off the wax of you on screaming, not this. Designer wounding, redesigned wounds, fakes of dysfunction, their period screech, their period petulance. So rattle your reference and my, and my, and my. This poem built from the abusive repetitions of labour, the obscene rhythms of work and work and work, the pungent industrial all dissolving, your snot-nosed insurrectionist picking the scab off a capital, your scandalised eerie, the sprung punk of peevish refrain, hoary Englander, the asphyxiating chill gag enthusiast, nerd in an era of intercepts, incel slur for my, 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 you doomed Alex of envoy, my, my, my gaslit futility, we want... Scrambled and tropic a pain like speed in the stomach ulcer. We want, in the grip of thin, fading menace, this Britain thing disgorges its post-war into our face. We want critics bootlegging a eulogy. We want lotus of post-mortem covert pastoral loadedly rhapsodized. You wish foaming on forums, shouting down the day. We want a hot animus face like a punctured lung, the canonically joyless suburbs, the stink of scripture, the scrim of toil fomented and felled in webs of glory. The mind broken, strenuously gentrified into baroque disclosures, into tracts, paperbacks, into you, three sentence meets. It's you, you charming harbingers, you harbingers of charm, you frontmen, you poster boys, you prevailing parliament of. 
we want, rather than the royal loop to loping, the sickness of intercourse, something is moving out there in the grey blue, grey with sinuous tyranny, something like a foregone boyfriend handle already, something stupendous, malevolence, malevolently stupid and you wish you could see all this. Tirades, butterfly and spirit by vernacular angst, check. Sordid distortions, check. To live this, to live in this, you want this. Who are you kidding? I'm you pleased to hear I'm going to finish. Um, I nearly got through that. I nearly worked okay. Nearly. Not quite. Nearly. Gonna do Black 22. I'm going to do because it wasn't a very good year, was it? 2022 or 2023. Or now that I think about it, 2024 is not shaping up brilliantly either. So, never mind. Soon they'll all be dead. In the end, they will eat their own clay kitten railing. If you think they won't, you are so wrong, never mind. You're tired all the time. Your name is leaking from the sly puckered mouths of your affluent frenemies. There is an obscure pain, a hot obstruction in the mouth, in the bowel. How to go on, the peeling skin of you is socially sown. You sweat this winter undertaking, I swear, these English eat their own. Oh, starry-eyed economies, the force spite swallowed in a wimpy text, doubled up to the bent scope of a wiry, tory thought. You bank their dirty normal, take it inside, save it for later. Your hunger is climbing the black rungs of an onion, while Jamie Networth Oliver tells you how to break yourself up over a blue flame for under a pound. You will scrape the spent heat from your duvet as the nightmare exceeds your defeatist thrashing. You are tired all the time so graciously mortgaged, so softly despairing in the silk pyjamas of your dead zeal. You carry your rage on your back like a failed parachute, falling like a failed suicide, drifting to earth, the determined feather you weigh next to no. Well, there is no food. They have sharpened the songbirds, the soft birds, the weasel teeth of ego, the bagging hooks, patient caresses. In the end, you will slump in the dark, strewn and rouge, staring the pinhole down. You will open yourself like a bloodshot eye, cabbage white curses flicking all over you. You were the pre loved coin of your own realm, dry humping your nothings to sweetness. Oh, metered screw, oh, sunder flop, oh, dusty bite word. If you can, you will glow the machine to tokens, spooning the ready honey of yourself into their holes, their failed claims of dug in your gold rush. If you can't, then on to the side hustle of a stopped heart to the Amazon mantras of a mindfully fuck doomed as food. And Jeff Networth Besos is your personal fucking rain cloud, is your household god curling a jeweled shit in your half. I'm not trying to frighten you, but you must be ready. Your stomach spilling open its warm rake of ash, its scald of air, its sawdust mountain of mouldy bangers. Oh, cadaver girl, we were lions. We could fit this light bulb moon in our mouths. Now look, this Angerland, this nasty salivatrix smoothing her hair, dressed in a mail of cancer monsters. They are not men, they are zombies in heat. They don't eat because they're hungry, they eat because they can. And we are hanging like cured meat inside a life of airless, viral humiliations. We were warriors, would trample them, all open folds, all sugared sneaks. In a gown of heaving weather, be the dressed axe. Enter again, this cutting fold. Thank you. Thank you, friend. Um, so just to finish uh, the evening with, um, we are going to have a 10 minute, 15, where are you, 15 minute with Gazal and the writers who are staying behind. Uh, I need to call the restaurant that we're going to be late as per usual. Um, but I just wanted to say uh, the next, we're going to have a little break um, as we are heading into Easter uh, at the university, so we'll have a four or five weeks break uh, with the center's readings, and then the next one again is the 24th of April with uh, Simon Perrin, Simon Smith, Francis Presley, and... Um, 
Peter. Peter Robinson. <laughs> OMG, I nearly have forgotten Peter. Um, and then we'll finish the, the term with on the 8th of May with the, with the final reading, more on that soon. So just a huge thank you once again. Uh, can we say a huge thank you to Safa, JR, Gaza, and Tom. That was something, I think. And thank you all for coming. Don't go yet. <laughs> <laughs>